Good evening, everyone. How are you this evening? Welcome to Transformational Talks with Coach BJ, X the Expert Series. So I'm going to give some people some time to come on in. Come on and join us and let us know that you are here tonight. As always, I am super excited about these talks. I love the information uh, that is brought and, and prayerfully to help someone in their journey in life. I see two people on already, so go ahead and let us know that you are here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, Sinead, thank you so much for joining. Good to see you tonight. Good to see you. As you guys come on in the room, go ahead and let us know that you are here. I'm going to go ahead and open us up as I normally do. As more people continue to follow on in, I'm seeing the numbers rising. So go ahead and let us know that you're here tonight. Thank you so much for joining. So I want to welcome everybody to tonight's Ask the Expert. Um, so if you believe this topic, love still wins, life after divorce is going to be a blessing to someone or a benefit to someone, please share this live. And it's not just about divorce. It's about being in even long-term relationships that you you know, felt was going to last or lead into marriage. I mean, this applies to everybody, right? And even if it's not you, right? I mean, it can be some advice that you can share with someone else if you have the chance. Good evening, Samia. Thank you so much for joining. Good to see you tonight. Haven't seen you since December. <laughs> Hi, Michelle. Thank you so much for joining. Glad you are here. And Michelle is actually going to be our expert in a couple of weeks. So I'm excited to really share her topic and information. So thank you for joining. So again, welcome. Share with you those who you believe that will benefit from this talk. So come on in the room. Again, our topic tonight is love still wins, life after divorce. Divorce, And I'm going to say long-term relationships as well. I'm going to just put it out there. So um, for those of you who are joining for the first time, Ask the Expert was created for professionals to come on and talk um, and share their knowledge and gifts and expertise, either in their personal journeys and their professional um, and provide their knowledge and insight um, to our viewers um, on ways to overcome obstacles or challenges or, you know, or even be inspired sometimes or learn something new. You know, that is the... Um, the constant, you know, for Ask the Expert. I really want to be able to bring these experts on to really share their expertise. Christina, so good to see you tonight. Good morning. So before we get started, as I always say, you want to go ahead and take out your journals and notebooks because you're going to be taking a lot of notes. Like I say, even if it's something or a topic that can help you take notes for somebody else and be able to share it if somebody call you with this situation and want to cry on your shoulder or be emotional, whatever the case may be, have some words of wisdom that our expert tonight is going to share to share with them and say, hey, you know, I heard this talk and, you know, Lee, boy, I tell you, she has some words of wisdom and some jewels for us, you know, so let me share what I know with you, right? So it's not always about you. It's always about, you know, learning and gathering information for somebody else. Um, so our, I'll go ahead and introduce our expert tonight as people continue to come on in. Let us know you're in the room. Let us know you're here. Um, so our special guest tonight is um, Lee Trust Smith. She is a healthcare executive, caregiver advocate, and also a woman advocate. And Lee and I actually met in high school some years back um, in high school. We're not going to say how long. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> but um, we reconnected on Facebook in our adult life. And our relationship really evolved into a close friendship and sisterhood. And it's just been a blessing ever since then. But she is someone that inspires me. I love her journey. I love the things that she has done in the world. And when I get ready to read her biography, you will know why. <laughs> um, she is such a blessing to so many people. She really advocate for a lot of people, really keep us informed, um, not only with her position, but with her uh, philanthropy work that she does. So she's just really a blessing in so many areas. So before we get into the topic tonight, Esther, welcome. Thank you so much for joining. Good to see you on tonight. So before we get into the topic, let me share a little bit about Lee with you. So Lee is a healthcare executive based here in Atlanta, Georgia. And throughout her almost 20 year career, she has served as vice president of quality, director of patient safety, accreditation and risk management, and also director of oncology services and women imaging in the hospital setting. She is the founder of the Investor Club, one of those uh, groups I told you about, a social group dedicated to serving women and cultivating relationships that support personal and professional goals. She also recently launched a Cardinal Development Group, LLC. It is a management consulting firm 
and the Care Companion LLC, a caregiver support organization as well. Her most recent project is Love in the Key of Lee, an upcoming podcast where Lee will share her experiences with all things Or no matter how old we are, we need that communication. Local and national nonprofits. She serves on several nonprofit boards and have a passion for board development in nonprofit settings. She is a member of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, Mecca chapter, and a member of the National Council of Negro Women, the Henry Clayton County chapter. She is also the proud graduate of Leadership DeKalb class of 2019 and is a graduate of Florida a and University, Florida State University, and also Texas Women University. So Lee is also a newlywed recently married on January 1st, 2021 to Mike Smith. So um, I will tell you this before I turn it over to our wonderful expert tonight that you may see us blank out a little bit every now and again. There's you know, weather issues that is causing maybe the screen to blank out, but just hold tight with us. You should, you still should be able to hear Lee with no problem. Uh, so just stay tuned to all this wonderful information. Thank you so much guys for joining. And so without further ado, I am going to go ahead and turn this talk over to Miss Lee Trust Smith. Welcome her. Hey, good evening, everybody. I am super, super excited to be here um, with you all tonight. I heard some of the folks who were joining, and so I'm excited to know that there are some people in the room who I, I know. And um, Esther, thank you for joining, for your support. Samia, my dear friend, another from high school who is a powerful, powerful woman of God. So it's so great to hear um, some names that I, that I recognize. And so... <clears throat> For those of you that, who, who I do know, you know that um, I love interaction. And so for those of you who I'll be meeting tonight, um, this will not be anything short of um, uh, just a, a lecture, I guess, is what I'm saying. I need you to talk back to me. I need you to let me know if it's resonating. Um, and I need you to provide your feedback as well, because one thing I know about an expert in something is that they know that there are other experts that are out there too. And so each of you are the expert of your experience. Um, and so, so excited to, to be able to share my journey with you today. And um, hopefully we can learn from each other. So um, welcome to Christina. Um, Dr. Christina Grange and I have uh, done a couple of talks before on anxiety. Um, dear friend, but trusted colleague. And so thank you for joining tonight. Uh, and Latasha McC uh, McLeod as well. We've done some work um, in supporting women and a powerful uh, woman down in Florida, uh, one of our, our, our educators. So thank you all for joining tonight. So Love Still Wins, Life After Divorce. Um, this talk is really from the vantage point of when you have made a lifetime commitment to someone and one day it's over. And so um, many of you are aware that I was married um, uh, before for almost 12 years. And I was in my mid twenties um, when I met my first husband and excited about marriage. My parents now have been married for 48 years. And so I watched uh, my mom and dad in the home and I watched and had an example of marriage. And so um, I had this vision of what marriage looked like and I had this vision of what kind of wife I would be. And um, so I was super, super excited um, to to get married the first time. And um, that brought with it lots of experiences. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about living with someone. Y'all, I'm an only child. <laughs> so um, I can't just pack up my toys and go home, you know, when you're in a marriage. And so I learned a lot. But I will tell you, the journey to the end um, did not just happen one day. I didn't just wake up and say, um, I don't want to be married anymore. Um, things happen over time. And even those things that hurt, they don't often just come up and it's, I don't want to be married anymore. And so when a person or a couple makes a decision to divorce, um, it's a decision like no one could explain unless you've experienced it. And, and what somebody said to me that resonates is um, only you know when it's time, only you know when it's over um, and you should never jump before then. And so um, we decided uh, to get a divorce. And so I have um, been divorced now over five years. And um, even today, 
um, I still feel like I'm on that journey. Um, part of the reason the divorce was difficult is because I made a vow to the Lord. And for me as a believer, I felt like I was disappointing God. I felt like I was disappointing um, everything that I said that I was going to be in those vows on April uh, 10th, 2004. And I felt like um, I was ashamed that I wasn't able to make it work. I'm somebody who sets goals and reaches them. And so here was something that I fought and fought and fought and fought hard for, um, and I couldn't do it. So if any of you are out there and that resonates with you, just shout into the comments, me too, and let me see you. All right. So we're going to start with how to navigate grieving the death of a marriage, because if you haven't heard it uh, put this way before, it is a death. Um, a marriage is an identity. It becomes its own faction. And so when it goes away, it's like a death. It no longer exists. Those two people aren't coming home um, together anymore. I see you, Cheryl. Thank you. You know, they're no longer one. So it's a death. Thank you, Samia. And so we're actually going to talk about the five stages of grief. So let's put those up on the screen and see what they are. Um, and, and many of you have, have heard of or seen these before by Kubler-Ross and um, their denial. Um, so so that, that inkling of my marriage is over, um, the relationship is over, um, or maybe it's not over. You know, maybe I can do this a little bit longer. You know, maybe I can um, hang in there. Maybe it's not so bad. Maybe this is not one of those things that I said I would never allow, but maybe I really can allow it. Um, and, and maybe it's not that serious and maybe it's not that bad. Denial can look a whole bunch of different ways. Anger, you know, um, whether it was infidelity, whether it was um, misuse of money, um, whether it was um, uh, a mental illness that wasn't uh, managed. There are all kinds of things that could bring anger and resentment and being upset. Um, and so I, I think that once you get through these steps, and thank you, Tasha, made the comment, you can't, can't even start the healing process until you grieve the death. Once you get through these, um, then that's when true life after divorce begins, I believe. Bargaining is when you go back and forth. So I, I think this is PG. I don't think we have any babies on the on the call tonight. But <laughs> if your divorce experience with like mine, even during a separation, there are times when you come back together with your partner. There are times that you still share intimacy. And on one hand, you're thinking, am I crazy? Like, I, I still love this guy, but, you know, we can't be married. And so the bargaining back and forth and then the sadness that comes in. And then eventually you get to acceptance. And even though these are listed linearly, so you can see them on the on the screen um, or in a linear faction, they're not linear. It's a cycle with zigzags and you can go from acceptance to anger, from denial to bargaining. And there's no um, list or, or line that you have to go down um, to go through these and to experience them. So um, the point is, is that Accepting and acknowledging that your marriage has died is how you get to the part about life after divorce. So forgiveness, we talked a little bit about forgiveness um, and um, or I mentioned this last night, actually, <laughs> about forgiveness. Yeah, Jennifer, we all were. I see you. Um, forgiveness is a gift um, and it sounds easy in theory. But let me just ask the question, why is it so hard to forgive? Um, because I believe that forgiveness is a part of the acceptance piece of grief. Why is it so hard to forgive? Let, let me see some of your ans answers in the comments. Um, and then I have a short list um, that I'll share in my sources, uh, Psych Central, um, where I got some of these from and I added some to it. Accepting is hard. Agreed actually accepting what the person did to you and accepting that you need to, to let it go. Um, why are some other reasons? What are some other reasons um, why it's hard to forgive? Any other thoughts? You don't want the other person to win. It's a competition. You hurt me. Oh, no, no, no. I got the last word. So let me trump what you just did and do this to you. Oh, okay. So you want to try to take um, the car in the divorce. Okay. Well then I'm coming after your retirement. Okay. We can play that game. 
I win. I win. I have the last word. I slam my domino down on the table. I win. And Cheryl, you hit it. Many of us don't even know how to forgive. Um, so let's talk about a lot of a few of those pieces. The pleasure of resentment for some people is so sweet. There is something about holding on to a grudge that I think gives people power. Um, I think um, it makes someone think that if they can hold on to this grudge, they may not have been able to hold on to the marriage. They may not have been able to hold on um, to um, to the relationship, to the house, um, but they can hold on to the wrong uh, that somebody else did to them. So sometimes it's about control. And something else of mentioning, and I'll mention this now since Michelle put it in the comments, is that there are some things that are hard to forgive, um, but I'm going to still talk about that a little bit more. Um, thinking that somehow you not forgiving them will punish them. They hurt you. So no, you've asked me for forgiveness. I'm not giving it to you. No, I'm not. You know, you need to think about what you did to me. You need to think about what you did to our family. You need to think about what you did to our children. So, no, I'm not going to forgive you so that you can live the rest of your days understanding that because you did this, then this is the result of it. So, no, I'm not going to forgive you. Might be another reason. It might be a way of protecting ourselves or thinking that we're protecting ourselves from being hurt again. If we don't forgive, we can hold on to the pain so we remember what it feels like. So if we meet somebody and, and perhaps they're different or they're nice and maybe we 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 would like to try again, you don't want to get comfortable because when you got comfortable last time, you got hurt. It could be another reason. And, and something similar to what Christina said, and this is the last one on my list, and that is feeling like justice must be must be served because you did this. You need to accept punishment and you need to know that it's not acceptable. So this is your punishment. Um, justice will be served because you were wrong. All of that takes away from you. That's energy. That's um, stress. That's anxiety. That's emotions. All of that has a um, has a way of affecting your body. Self-love that we're going to talk about future relationships, and truly forgiveness is a gift to you. Forgiveness is not something that you can give to someone else. It is you giving yourself permission to no longer allow what somebody else did to you to, to, to control how you feel or how you react. That's it. It's a gift for you. And so I want to challenge any of you who are out there who are in a situation, uh, and I have been in a situation in the past where I have uh, been in domestic violence situations, um, have been grabbed, have been choked, and, and you in the moment think that you cannot forgive the, the most hurtful thing that somebody has done for you. I am here to tell you, you can. The process starts with you. And I hope that this talk tonight will just be, uh, make you begin to think about what are some things that you don't forgive, haven't forgiven, and why. And here's the takeaway. Here's your homework. Write this down. You got your pens and pads out. How is my lack of forgiveness affecting me? Y'all write it down. That's your homework. That's your homework. After this talk, go back, meditate, spend some time by yourself. How is my lack of forgiveness for this person affecting me? Thank you, Esther. Depression, um, sadness. Yep, Samia, it hurts the person holding the grudge more. It does. But let me tell you, in the moment, it seems so gratifying to be able to hold that over a person. But to Esther's point, it brings on so many other things. So everybody got their homework assignment? Jump in the comments and say yes. Um, go back and ask yourself, how is my not forgiving, fill in the blank, affecting me? All right. So we talked about um, the five stages of grief. We've talked about forgiveness, which I believe is a part of acceptance. And so now um, new life emerges. I'm divorced. Now what? 
And so now um, we're going to go in to talk about things that happen after divorce and what does that look like. Um, and so let's uh, let's say, hey, Big, how you doing? Thank you for joining. Um, and I get it being in that moment right now. I get it. Um, so let's see this quote uh, that I have. I'm a quote person, y'all, and I love them. And I got this from a classmate's uh, IG page. And so I wanted to share it with you. So new life emerges. I'm divorced. Now what? You have to decide whether you're going to let your past destroy you or whether you're going to let it build you into the strongest person you've ever met. Just leave that on the screen for a moment. I had a cousin tell me that she was proud of me. I had another friend tell me that, man, you're one of the strongest people that I've ever met. And I really didn't feel that way. I was let down. I was disappointed in myself. I thought I let my parents down. I let myself down. I let my stepdaughter down. I let my, um, my, my, my creator down. I just felt down. But when somebody said, um, you're strong and I'm proud of you, Today, I understand what that means. And I promise you, if you can get through those stages of grief, if you can offer forgiveness and then turn around and offer grace to yourself, new life can emerge. In the midst of all of this, though, ask yourself, are you going to let it take you out? Are you going to let it destroy you? Are you going to let it just just um, be the definition of who you are? Or will you use it to tell your story of how you overcome? Thank you for uh, posting the quote. Now, let's talk about some hot topics um, with uh, life emerging and, and going after uh, what do you do after a divorce? And I know it's 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 probably um, tempting to get into all sorts of things like name changes and um, what do you do with um, um, you know going and getting all the the business stuff handled, coming off of business accounts, bank accounts. Um, cell phones. I mean, all of that, I, I hopefully you all have, have understood or know if, if you're listening and you're not uh, in a, having a divorce or haven't had one, do know there's a business aspect after a divorce. But in talking about how you're going to live, we're going to talk about a couple of examples. Um, and, and I totally agree, Cheryl. You know, once you can get through it and you can share, it can be a testimony for others who are going exactly through the same thing you went through, just different people. Um, so let's talk about birthday parties, graduations, um, baptisms, um, chorus at school, which I guess they're not doing now. But let's talk about family functions and how you handle those. Um, I have just a couple of points that I want to say about that. And this came from um, one of our viewers tonight who put this on my page about things to discuss. You know, once the marriage is over, there are a whole lot of people who are affected by that. You've got in-laws, you got brother-in-law, sister-in-law, you got mother-in-law, father-in-law, their bonus children often in involved. Um, and if you're old enough, you may have grandchildren, their niece and nephews. How do you handle coming together with someone who you're no longer with, who may still be, it, it still may be hard to look at? Uh, the first thing is with grace. Remember, it's about fill in the blank. It's about your daughter. It's about your granddaughter. It's about um, the other family member. Remember what you're going for. Even though this can be something that is uncomfortable, you can get through it and you can do it with grace. And part of that is giving yourself permission to understand this is going to take a lot of energy today. So when you're preparing for those events, talk to yourself, meditate, listen to music, do some deep breathing as you're driving along, do things that will not add to the stress level that you already have. OK, the other thing to think about is that boundaries. Just because you're going into a family setting or a family function doesn't mean that you have to be thrust into this situation that's uncomfortable for you. Um, I this recently happened to me. I figured out a couple of people who I felt were safe in my mind. And if I felt like I was just kind of hanging out there and I needed to talk to somebody, I identified people who I could go and have a conversation with. So I wouldn't look standoffish or I wouldn't seem like I was uncomfortable. So create those boundaries, create those things in your mind that you can do and that you can rescue yourself while you're in the moment. And finally, with support, I'm going to tell a, a story about Christina now that she's on. Um, and this story is going to hopefully resonate with you because now I'm going to tie this into uh, forgiveness. Um, on December 20th, uh, 2020, my uh, first husband died unexpectedly. 
And um, you can imagine the emotion that I experienced um, having to grieve the physical death of someone who I'd been married to for almost 12 years, all while preparing to start a new life with someone else. And I tell you all, I, I admittedly am likely still grieving. It's February 4th. Um, he just died December 20th. And um, it was very difficult. One thing I can say to you is I'm so thankful I went to the funeral. I almost didn't go. The second thing is, is I'm so thankful that I had forgiven him. You have no idea the peace that I felt seeing him resting eternally um, understanding that we were not enemies and that I have forgiven him. And this is where I hope I can make clear how forgiveness is really a gift to you. Imagine the toil and the torment that I might have felt coming out of his death, um, still holding on to stuff um, that had never been resolved. So just think about that. And that's a real example. And I'm thankful that uh, he and I didn't have any ill will towards each other. And it was a very difficult time. But to the point of life emerging after uh, divorce, I had support. And I'm so thankful to my dear friend, Christina, for offering to go with me to the funeral. So that's probably my favorite tip when you're dealing with um, um, family functions and graduations and baptisms and special events. Take support with you. Not somebody who's going to be a fire starter, but somebody who is there to look after you and your spirit and to help, help bridge the gap. Okay. When I tell you, I was so afraid and I'm not going to cry tonight, y'all. I was so afraid walking into that funeral home thinking about all of the unresolved things that I had with my first husband's family and how they might think about me and how they might feel about me and how my bonus daughter might feel about me seeing me at a time like this, that I needed physically somebody who could hold my hand. And so when you have somebody with you in those situations, they almost uh, provide a force field around you and make it so that you can get through it. And we walked in and she was right there with me and I navigated through the family, navigated with my uh, my bonus daughter who I hadn't spoken to in a while, spoke to uh, a brother and niece and nephews and all of that. And I can tell you right now, I was only able to get through that because I had her with me. So thank you, Christina, blessings to you. And for each of you, if you've got children, there will be instances of family functions. They're inevitable. Remember that it's about the child. Remember to set boundaries, create um, you know, some, some people that you can talk to or some areas that you can go if you need an escape. Prepare when you're on your way. Don't do anything that day to stress you out. And listen, if you got a sister friend who you can take with you or a brother friend who you can take with you, take them with you, I promise. I promise that will help. Does that resonate with anybody? Uh, let me see you in the comments. How y'all doing out there? Love you too, Christina. And I didn't cry. Ah, yes. <laughs> okay. If you all are ready, um, it, we're going to kind of transition into um, talking more about um, life after divorce. And, 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 you know, one of the things that... Um, that was different for me was figuring out routines, new routines. And um, I said on my page last night for years, you all, um, after after my divorce, I slept on one side of the bed like I had pillows on the other side and I slept on one side of the bed. So life for divorce uh, for me afterwards was still feeling like I had to stay on my side of the bed. It sounds silly, but I promise if you haven't experienced, you'll, you'll think about things like this. And if there's some funny little things that you've experienced, drop them in the comments. Something else I recognized is that living alone as a woman, um, I didn't pay attention maybe to some little noises in the house. Um, I didn't pay attention to creaks and, and things in the house. But man, when you are living on your own, all of a sudden, 
the the noises in the house are just magnified. You hear things differently. And to be quite, quite transparent as a woman, I felt uncovered. I, I didn't feel like I had um, somebody to look out for me in a certain way. Uh, if there are any men who are out there watching, you all may have been in marriages where she handled all of the doctor appointments or she handled the meals. And so now it's like, you know, what am I supposed to eat or how am I supposed to cook? And I think this is a good time to stop and say, what do I need? What can I do? What can I do? And, and what, what am I okay with? There are no rules to this. And this is where giving yourself grace comes in. Um, I decided that I was going to no longer feel guilty about sleeping on one side of the bed. It just is what it is. I continued to do it. I found comfort, comfort in it. It was fine. Um, cooking changed. And let me tell you, and I know I'm going to get some amens on this. When you are used to being married and, and having a few people in the house and you go um, from cooking uh, for five people to one Y'all, I was I was struggling. I, that was so hard to figure out. How do you how do you cook now for just one? And uh, you know, the best advice I could give is portion size. Cook what you're gonna cook. Freeze it. Whatever you cook, make sure it's something you can freeze. So so talking through these little routines may sound really simple and may sound insignificant. But anybody who has gone through the gone through a divorce has had to figure out what their routines are um, and what will they be. And so I would challenge you all to make a list of things that you like um, and things you'd like to try. Because a lot of us have been so um, pigeon held into that whole, or not whole, into the role of being a wife or being a husband. We didn't really think much outside of what was good for the unit. So now that you find yourself af after a divorce, you know, reconnect with yourself, find things that you like, maybe that you didn't get to do before. I found that there was a creative side of me that I didn't even realize. Um, there's music and, and things that I really connected with that I didn't really connect with um, that first time. And that that's not a bad thing, um, but it's just a reality. So figure out who you are, try new things. Um, my first um, Christmas after my divorce, I flew to South Beach by myself and celebrated Christmas by myself. Scared me to death, y'all, um, <laughs> because my family is very tight. And to actually be spending Christmas away from them was a big deal. I thought I would let them down. I thought it would make them sad, but I needed to do that for myself. And it is, uh, Tasha, it's the little things that you don't even think about. It's an adjustment. So the powerful thing about going to uh, South Beach for Christmas was that it gave me a chance to reset. Holidays were very important to me. I was grieving the holidays. So not only was I grieving the loss of my relationship, I was grieving the loss of putting up a tree and, and putting up lights. And, and yes, could I have done that by myself? Absolutely. Would it have been the same? Absolutely not. And so for me, I had to grieve holidays and to figure out how I wanted to spend them. So going somewhere by myself, was a chance for me to replenish, to renew, to read, to pray, to cry, to yell, to scream, <laughs> to say, um, this is who you are. I spent a lot of time looking in the mirror and thinking, okay, what you gonna do now, chick? You know, what, what's up next for you? So um, spend that time, look at yourself in the mirror, naked. Make sure you understand who you are and who you wanna be and do just that. Um, affirmations are so powerful. Doesn't matter what your what your love language is. I think we fluctuate through all of them anyway. But affirming who you are is so powerful. Something as simple as putting something on your mirror or something in your car every day. I am a powerful woman. I love hard. I care for people. I help people. Um, I am going to be. I'm going to have a good day today. I'm not going to be sad today. I am going to be grateful for everything I've experienced. And I tell you this, um, as you're talking about life after uh, a divorce and new life emerging, find something in that relationship that you grieved that's good. Hold on to it. Everything about your spouse was not bad. I can't believe it. You married him. So at some point, there was something about that person that was good. Be intentional about finding what that is and cherish the memory. Just like we cherish memories of loved ones who pass, 
cherish a memory of, of the death of your, your marriage by finding something good about that person that resonates with you, that you can hold on to and that you can keep. One lesson that I remember learning um, from my first husband was because I'm an only child, if somebody frustrated me or hurt my feelings, I wanted to pack up my toys and go home. And he said to me, he said, Lee, this is family. This is the only family you got. You know, you got to love people through stuff. Give them some grace. You're going to want grace. You don't get to just pack up your toys and go home. That resonated with me years ago, and I still remember it to that to this day. And so that little piece from Nate, I carry with me, and it's a positive memory, and I that won't ever leave me, and I will always give him credit for that. All right. So self-love is another uh, big topic when we're talking about life after divorce, because when you've spent your life spending um, so much time about your spouse, so much time about the kids, you know, about other people, um, especially women, very rarely do we get a chance to kind of do check-ins and, and make sure that we're good. So one of the things that I say when thinking about self-love is that you have got to learn how to love yourself um, before loving someone else. You got to learn how to love yourself before you love someone else. Too many times we come to the table with all our brokenness, and we all are, we all have something, and we expect that man or that woman to come in and heal us. That, that's not their role. That's not their responsibility. Everything that happened to us prior to meeting them is not their fault. Yes, they should know, what we're dealing with. They should know any triggers. They should know any things that we struggle with, but it is not their duty to make us whole, to make you whole. And so the first part of self-love is understanding that you have a responsibility to yourself to make yourself whole. Anything else that comes from a partner is just gravy. And so this is a powerful quote that I want to share with you. And I'm not sure who the author is, but again, I got it from a friend's page. Every human in the world could love you and it still wouldn't be enough. Still wouldn't be enough if you don't love yourself first. And that's because people can tell you, oh, no, you look good. Or, oh, no, I like your hair. Oh, no, I like this. If you don't know that yourself, it doesn't matter. It's just words. And so please, please, please um, let this quote resonate with you. Every human in the world could love you and it would still not be enough if you don't love yourself. So right now in the comments, I want you to type, I love this about me and tell me what that is. I want to know, what do you love about yourself? I'll give an example. Um, I love that I love people and that I'm a giver and, and, a, and a caretaker and I want to, to make sure that people are well. Um, and I love that I have a big heart. So let me hear you. Let me see you in the comments. What do you love about yourself? Any comments coming? And I know there may be a lay. I love the passion I have for my purpose. Yes. What else, guys? And if this is hard to do, then there's some work to do. I love my fortitude. Hey, Kristen, welcome. I love my fortitude. What else do you love about yourself? Anybody else? I love that I am a giver and love supporting my sisters. Yes. What else? All right. So I love that I am solid, trustworthy, and loyal. Yes, Christina. And so the goal of this exercise, I love my spirit, Esther. Yes. I love my hustle. Hey, Cass McMahon. Yes. I love my passion for doing for others. Yes. The light I radiate when I'm in my best self. I feel it. Yes. I love that. I love that I have a big heart. Yes. How did you feel typing those words? I love my passion for people. It's something when you proclaim over your own self, when you make proclamations about yourself. That's so powerful. I felt your energy just reading the words. So imagine if you continue to pour into yourself and you continue to say those things and affirm yourself daily, um, just what kind of force you can be. And then you can begin to heal maybe some of those wounds that may have been caused by past relationships, by parents, by other people, by traumas that we've experienced. Heal yourself, talk to yourself, affirm yourself, love yourself um, before trying to love someone else. And so there's some regimens that you can do um, for this. And, and, and listen, 
whether that's getting your nails done, whether that's going um, and getting a massage, whether that is spending time journaling, um, spending time on your business, you should choose one hour a week to pour into yourself more than one hour a week. You should do it every day. But there should be some focus time, focus time every week that you say, I'm going to do this for me. Every day should be, but for some of our lives, that may be difficult. So think about what is that one thing that you're going to commit to doing for yourself every day and every week. Daily things might be affirmations or affirming myself. Weekly things might be um, painting, drawing, creating, um, writing, you know, different things. The point is, is to make it a priority, priority to sow into yourself and to love yourself. What happens when we get into relationships and we don't love ourselves is that we put all of that pressure onto our partners and half the time they don't even know and they don't even know what we expect. We just feel like they're supposed to fix us. And that's so unfair. So please think about that as, as you are thinking about life after divorce. And especially if you're thinking about um, re-entering another relationship, um, how to ensure that you are together and that you are um, uh, in touch with your own barometer of love um, prior to getting into something with someone else. All right. All right. Y'all ready to move? So um, use your words might seem a bit out of order because we're talking about life after divorce. But I wanted to talk about communication because communication is also often a pitfall of divorce. Couples talk at each other. They miss each other. They talk over each other. They talk under each other. They hit below the belt. There's so many things that come up um, with couples when it comes to communication. Um, and so this a uh, couple of years ago, this came to me because I learned that in my first marriage, I was such the caregiver, wanted everything to be OK, that I often suppressed what I really felt. Anybody out there experience that? I kept my emotions quiet. I kept my voice silenced because I thought that was for the better good of the family. It was for the better good of my husband. When inside, I was just just dying and having all kinds of anxiety inside. And so using your words is important for a few reasons. It allows you to get what you're feeling out. And then it allows the other person to know how to move, what to do, what to expect. Um, we talk about um, a lot of times that you can't hold somebody accountable um, for what they don't know. And that sounds good in theory, but a lot of times I believe our partners they get jumped on by us because they didn't do something right, but they didn't even know it was something that we wanted, you know, or perhaps they did something that affected us or upset us or made us sad. And what we tend to do is react. So what's the number one way in which we react? What well, it starts with an A. Somebody drop it in the comments. When something happens we don't like, how do we respond? Mm hmm. I agree, Samia, you do, you live and you learn. It was a bad feeling for me as well. So I'll tell you, anger. Anger is the number one emotion that happens when there's a breakdown in communication, anger. And when you begin to peel away the layers of anger, you, yep, thank you, Bernita, you find fear, you find sadness, you find someone being unsure, uncertain. Um, so there's some insecurity there when you lashed out with all this power and really the person is now reacting to the power and the energy and the the loudness versus really what's happening in your heart so i want to challenge you um and we're going to go through some some steps of how to um use your words to to really think about saying to people you know what when you decided to go and take money out of our savings account and spend it on a new toy, it made me feel like you just didn't have any regard for our family goals, our family plans, and that you respected me enough to come and talk to, with me first. An example. So the formula is when you do this, it makes me feel like this. I promise you, if you incorporate that formula in your communication with your partner, it cuts down on so much reaction and response to the anger. So again, if you did this or when you do this, 
it makes me feel like this. And so now we're very clear about what the real issue is and what the real outcome is when it's done. When you give the, the partner that you're with that kind of, of information, then they are better able to care for us and to love us and to communicate with us and to coexist. Not giving them that vital information means that you're just going back and forth, tit for tat, tit for tat, and you never even really get to the real issue. All right. So we're going to talk about seven ways uh, to use your words. OK, seven ways. The first one, if you are ready, is to understand what you're feeling. You know, a lot of times we are dealing with some things underneath the surface and things can just kind of come out of our mouth. And it's really not about that. <laughs> We're just tense and stressed and we just, you know, going off on folks and checking folks. So you really need to understand what you're feeling. This is a real issue for women, especially. Um, but when uh, women suffer from um, premenstrual syndrome, you know, we, we've we basically made it um, a negative thing. And there's so many memes and stereotypes about PMS, but PMS is real, y'all. And I remember in my first marriage, it began to affect me. Um, uh, I began to get depressed, but the irritability um, became strong. And I remember talking to my OBGYN and she gave me some great advice. Understand what you're feeling and then communicate it to your family. So I would, I would say to my spouse, um, you know what? I am I am getting ready to start my cycle, for example. And um, I'm really feeling irritable today, you know. So understand your feelings, communicate your feelings to anybody around you. And so this is even not just about partners, because, again, you know, many of us or many folks on this call are single. This is about your children. Sometimes our children get jumped on for stuff and they're like, mom is tripping. Dad is tripping. So, again, understand your feelings. Um, yeah, that's exactly right, Michelle. Pregnancy is included in that too. And especially after the baby is born and Michelle, we could probably do a whole talk on that. Um, but I appreciate you adding that because that also speaks to a change or a shift in routine. There's a new human. There are tons of hormones. There's tons of pressure on both parents. So you're exactly right. All right. Let's, let's go to the second one. Be discerning about who you share your feelings with. Okay discernment be discerning about who you share um your feelings with this is a big one you know a lot of uh, guys give us ladies a hard time because we take things back to other sisters and our tribunal and we tell all of the the marital business or we tell everything that's going on and the fellows are looking at us like you're going to ask your friend who has no idea about how to do this thing called marriage about what to do and come back and try to execute their advice um, and you know what, ladies, the brother's got a point. Sorry, we do do that. Be very careful about who you take counsel from. Um, I've experienced um, getting counsel from someone who clearly we were not on the same page about understanding that even though I may be upset about something, I'm not ready to throw the baby out with the bathwater yet. You know, so understand who you're seeking counsel from, um, who you're sharing information with, um, protect the integrity of your situation. And again, this doesn't even have to be in a relationship, your own information, you know, be careful about who you put that out there with. And I'm a big proponent about not all energy is good energy. Not all um, information is good information. And sometimes people don't know how to handle what you share with them. So if you have a confidant, that's one thing, but just be real careful about who you share that with. Respond. This is the third one. Respond. Don't react. It is so tempting if they could figure out how to get us to not react, um, I think a lot of people <laughs> would be in a lot better place. And let me just say this, y'all, we are not our 100% best selves every day. We just aren't. And this is, again, where you have to give yourself some grace. But if you are reacting more than you are responding, then there is some work to do. So respond. And a lot of times you don't have to respond right away. If there's been something that has been said to you, or been done to you and you feel all of that emotion bubbling up in you, uh, bubbling up in you, give yourself a time out, step away from the situation, talk to yourself, meditate, pray, calm down, write it down. You know, you've, you've heard the adage about, you know, typing an email when you're mad and how that's not a good thing to do. Um, but if you're going to do it, then sleep on it. Y'all, every single time I have typed a communication um, on email and said, this is exactly what I'm sending. And I save it until the next day. Every single time I have changed what I was going to say. 
every single time. So remove yourself um, and then allow yourself to respond and be able to go back and say, I'd like to talk about what happened. Now, you can't ignore uh, your child, your partner, your coworker, you know, whoever you're communicating with, you can't ignore them. But you can you can say and this is this is language that I use. You know what? This is no longer productive. Um, I'm not sure I can figure this out right now, so I just need some time. Promise you we can come back and talk about it. You know, is tomorrow a good time? Is next week a good time? Or I'm not really sure when I'm going to be able to talk about this. I'm still processing. Use your words and communicate to the person that you need time. All right. Ready for number four? Find the right time. Find the right time. I'll tell you something I was guilty of doing before. And actually, I've done this in my, <laughs> in my new marriage. Because I'm feeling something and I want to talk about something and I feel like something should be expressed. I will come through the door and, hey, can we talk about how we're going to save up to go to that trip? Like, do we need to take money from this account or do we need to not, you know, eat out for this many weeks? And do we need to do <laughs> so we can become overwhelming to people when we're communicating um, or sharing with them? Yes, Christina, it, it's all about responsibility. But um, yeah, so you can overwhelm somebody and totally miss a moment all because it wasn't the right time. How many of you know when is a good time to talk about serious things? It varies. So coming home after work, talking about a serious family matter may not be the best thing. First thing in the morning before you start your day, before you go to work, may not be the best time. So think about it. Understand for you, when's a good time to have tough discussions? And I'm not saying that you hold on to things and, and let them fester. You know, you've got to communicate. But think about when is a good time um, for, for me to receive information and for me to give information. And then the second part is figure out how that applies to your partner. And watch this and your children. I think sometimes as parents, we think that because we're the grownups, we're the adults, we can just hit kids with stuff when we want to. Y'all, they are little people with little emotions and little feelings. So it's not always a good time for the kiddos either. Some of them have a hard time waking up in the morning. Some of them need more time to get going. All of uh, my friends out there that know me um, knows that I am, uh, um, let's see, I am a uh, not a morning person. I go slow. I need I need some ramp up time. I, I need some time to uh, <laughs> to get started. And so when you're talking about communication with your children, think about that as well. Yes, you're the parent. Yes, you have every right to say what you want to say when you want to say it. Yeah. But if it's not being laid on fertile ground, if your seeds, your words are not uh, falling on fertile ground, then that just means you're going to be more frustrated in the future. So specifically with partners, please, please, please um, think about um, finding the right time to have tough conversations. And I've talked about this in other talks, but um, in my, my first marriage, we created, and we're going to do this in, in uh, my current marriage, we created a voice jar. And this works with kids, works with adults too. You know, to have a jar that you put somewhere in a common area of the house, write this down. And when things come up, that you want to you want to talk about with the family or talk about with your partner, write it down, put it in the jar. You won't forget about it. Um, and it's 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 in the jar. So, you know, it will be addressed. What we used to do was every Sunday evening after dinner, we would come together. We would take the jar and we would pass the jar around. So it wasn't even about a, identifying what you wanted to say. Whoever picked the little paper out of the jar got to say um, the issue. And then we talked about it as a family. Voice jars or issue jars are excellent with families, excellent with children, um, excellence with partners as well. So so give that a try. Put it in the kitchen. Put it somewhere where you can't just open it and, and read it. You know, the person needs to know that when they voice their concern or voice their issue, that it can be put there, understanding that it's going to come back um, at, at a time when it can be discussed. All right. Be direct. No time for the games. But be direct with love. Um, so when you when you start game playing and, and going around the mulberry bush, people don't know where to land. There is a way where you can be very direct, be very clear about what you're feeling, be very clear about your intentions um, without being hurtful. Now, 
That does not mean that what you say won't hurt someone, but it is important, especially in relationships to make very clear. It is not my intent to hurt you. I do need you to hear how I'm feeling. And if you need to give that disclaimer, give it, but ensure that whatever it is you're communicating, it's done in love and that you're not using your words as weapons. Y'all, our tongues slash people and you cannot unring a bell. There's certain words that should be off the table. Certain words like punk or weak or um, especially dealing with men, calling men weak or be a man. Women, we tend to do that sometimes when we're trying to check a man and tell him how to be a man, be a man, you know, stand up. That is so damaging and emasculating to men. And so there are some words that need to be put in a no use <laughs> jar shelf that you just don't pick up because they're so damning. Hitting below the belt, using information um, that you know about the person and using it in an argument. Is that being direct? Likely. Is it hurtful? Yes. Will it benefit you in the end? No. OK, so think about that as you're being direct. Think about your word choices that you use. Generalizations always, never are so damaging. You never do this. You always talk about this. Doesn't allow room for grace. So if somebody has done something in the moment, tell them in the moment what the action was. The evers and the always just people shut down. Okay. So think about that. Not using um, um, absolutes when you're communicating. All right. Number six, almost there. Pay attention to body language and tone of voice. I, I say this often. The body often speaks louder than any words that, that a person could ever say. I look to see if the person is leaning in at, as I'm talking to them. Are they sitting back? Um, are their arms crossed? Um, are they looking off into the distance? Um, do we have eye contact? Is the tone confident? Is it sure? Is it loving? Or is it condescending? Is it sarcastic? You know, a lot of times we say things and, and then somebody reacts and we're like, what? I said this? Yeah, it's how you said it. And so you are responsible um, for not just hearing their tone of voice, but also making sure that your tone of voice is in a way that can be palatable for somebody else. I know somebody is saying, ouch, I say ouch to a couple of these. All right, finally, number seven is be a good listener. So we think that most often um, communication is just us getting information out. It's then having the return, either validation that somebody heard you and that they recognize it, or they need clarification, they don't understand, or they don't agree. And so the listening part is important to ensure that effective communication has happened. Um, so I got these steps and added a few to it from psychcentral.com. Uh, and it was just a great um, way to look at how do you use your words in communication and what to think about when communicating. Um, so I hope that this um, resonates with you. Um, it is 7.57 and we are here at the top of the hour. And so I just want to say that for anybody out there um, who has gone through uh, a divorce, is going through a divorce, or some sort of separation of an identity, of a sacred vow, of a marriage, of a partnership, do know that, that love still wins. Above all things, love still wins. And that is because love is patient. Love is kind. It does not boast. Love itself is the thing that can heal so many um, ailments that we have. And so no matter what kind of bombshell was dropped in the past on your first marriage, you are not a slave to that. And at the end of the day, the love that you have for yourself, the love that you have, hopefully for a, a creator, a higher power. I profess Christ. You may have another creator or God that you pray to, but whoever you see to, you speak to or see as a higher power, those things, those things coupled in love allows you to be a lot better lover for somebody else and allows you to be loved a lot easier as well. Um, I'm going to get ready to um, bring in um, Coach BJ, but I do want to say part of this journey um, for me has now culminated with me wanting to talk more specifics about my story. And so there is a podcast that will be coming up soon, and it's called Love and the Key of Lee. Um, some of you know I played the piano for years. 
Um, and so um, in the key of lead means, this is in my story. And these are just the things that I went through and I want to share them. And so today was just truly an overview about life after divorce, talking about grieving the death, talking about forgiveness, talking about grace, um, talking about self-love. And there's so much more that we can do in each of these topics, um, talking about how to deal with um, family events and then how to deal with um, using your words and communicating. So there's so much more to explore here. So I invite you all to join me um, soon um, when that podcast launches, but you can follow me on Instagram or Facebook at Love in the Key of Lee. And if you have not heard it in a while, I love each of you and appreciate you joining tonight. And there's nothing you can do about it. Love still wins. There is life after divorce. And so I am thankful that God has blessed me with another opportunity to try love again with Michael Smith. And um, we'll keep you posted on our journey. Thank you, Coach BJ. Oh my God, thank you so much. I didn't mean to pop back in so soon. My button just hit it. I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> You're fine. Come on into the room. Thank you guys um, for watching as always. Oh my God, everything was just amazing. Everything that came out of your mouth was just so on point. And I know just based on the interactions, based on the things that people have said that definitely um, everybody was blessed by this. I'm look, constantly looking at the comments with everything, you know, and I'm going to put some of the comments up here as we get ready to close out. And, you know, Alexa said, love still wins. Michelle, you know, saying hey. thank you. Um, your parents are on. Oh my God. Love. Hey, Somebody love me me on there. <laughs> Lord, y'all didn't tell me the parents was in the room. Y'all oh my like, God. Ebony, <laughs> Ebony said great discussion. And you know, she was like, you used to play the heck out of the young and the restless. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, so true, Ebony. Wow. Yeah, I hope you guys were blessed um, by this talk. It was just amazing. I thank you guys for watching as always. And I am positive that you guys got something out of this talk. And I mean, it was just really a blessing. And um, before you guys go, I just want to share with you um, some of the upcoming talks that's going to be on Transformational Talks that's coming up this month. Actually, I posted February as the love month, um, but there's love talked about a different way. So it, we kicked it off with Lee talking about love still wins life after divorce. And then I'm going to come on next week on the 11th, and I'm going to talk about the love languages and um, all five of them with their descriptions. You're going to learn your love language based on what I talk about and how it impacts not just your romantic relationships, but just your relationships overall. Um, I think yeah. I mentioned about even knowing my sister's love language, right? That's my sibling. And I know her love language and how she likes to be loved and receive love. So it's more than just romantic relationships, but it's just how do people like to receive love? And you're going to learn that from me next week. Uh, same place, same time here next week. Um, also on the 18th, we're going to bring in Michelle Riles. And oh my gosh, she's going to be talking about navigating toxic relationships. So as you can see, I wanted to bring out variables of different types of love. So there can be toxic love, there can be love still wins, and there can be those love languages. So I just wanted to bring a variety in this month. And she's going to cover the signs of a toxic relationship. No, I uh, launched a new platform uh, this year, uh, which is Spotlight Tuesdays with Coach BJ. And that platform is every first and third Tuesdays at noon, where I actually spotlight and what I say expose God's best as it relates to small businesses and nonprofit organizations. And to hear the inspiring stories of those entrepreneurs or executive directors and finders of these nonprofit organizations um, that is really making a difference in hopes that they will inspire you to tap into yourself and look at your purpose and, and what God has called you to do. And my uh, spotlight for the second one for this month is going to be on February. Mm -hmm. With her, what makes house pride so special. And if you have a veteran
My Facebook page um, is also um, at the Source of Hope One as well, which will provide all of the advertisement, all of the upcoming talks. And again, you can follow Lee on her um, page, Instagram, um, Lee, love in the key of Lee, and also just Lee or um, Facebook, okay? So um, if there aren't any more comments or questions, um, we'll close out. Um, your parents came on in again and they left their, their closing comments. I just love them. Oh my gosh. And Lakeisha gave a, a, a ovation clap. I mean, everybody should really clap for this talk. This was really amazing. And for those of you who are going to be coming on and watching the replay, um, any questions or comments you want to make, please leave them. We will see them even um, on the replay. So thank you guys for watching. If there is nothing else, um, as I always say, I love you. God bless you. Thank you for uh, your time and consideration um, and just giving your time in the evening. Got the hard day of work. So we just thank you for coming on. And, you know, again, we hope that this talk has blessed you. Have a wonderful night. Goodbye. <laughs>